So uh, we can't put all that in a simple condition. Um, but I think, to me, really, this work is going to be what we need to do over the next couple of years to figure out how we evaluate it thoroughly. Is this my concern? I mean, if I look at just numbers, for um, this year's submission, I think it's about 16 million in administrative costs on an 800, you know, plus million dollars. So you're talking about, I think it was like 1.6, 1.7%. Um, you know, our savings or risk orders go between, you know, let's say on average about 4% on either side. Mm -hmm. So you certainly, we could have a year an unfortunate year where we're 2% above, um, or you could have a year where you're below, but I think it, it's just maybe challenging, I'm not sure if this is a cumulative number, um, to maintain that savings each year. And the other part of it, which I think you did bring up a little bit, is where would healthcare have gone without this? So if we're capping at a 3.5, but the rest of the nation is at five, to how do we attribute that? So I just felt this, and I, did, I brought it up last year too, was yeah. difficult to really measure and quantify. Not that we shouldn't be looking at administrative costs as a total, which we are, and I think that's one way to look at it, and not that we you know, shouldn't be looking for savings to come out of the system. I think it just may be challenging to put you know, that percentage. I'm still it's not really clear. I guess if it's they should, you know, that, that kind of leaves open the fact that it may not happen or when will it happen? Because I guess, you know, the, the challenge would be what do you do in a year or two years if we're just holding flat? There's no savings, mm -hmm. but we're dead on the money. Mm -hmm. Where there's slight savings, there's 1% savings, but we're saying you've got to save 1.6 or 1.8% if that's what you're told. I, I look at it that we looked at the administrative expenses relative to the cost and relative to what they were doing prove that. So as I heard the motion, uh, it basically was over the lifetime of the agreement, so that in a given year, um, especially in the beginning years where you need to make investments, um, that would not have to uh, be the case. And I think there's uh, an implied promise throughout this um, whole uh, agreement that we're trying to, as we try to move away from fee-for-service to value-based medicine, that um, costs will be controlled. So I, I think it's an important piece to have as a condition because quite frankly, um, it's not necessary because it'll be self-correcting because if the ACO cannot, cannot uh, demonstrate that they're moving um, healthcare in the right direction, they're not gonna be able to get the targets at the scale because no one is going to wanna participate. So I, I just think it's a, a useful reminder of an implicit um, promise that has been made to people to, as we move away from fee-for-service to value-based medicine, that um, one of the goals is to have less stuff being done while better coordinating care um, and improving quality, but at the same time containing costs. So I, I think it's an important piece of the motion that she made. Yeah, I think it's just one thing that it is doing, if we think about the long haul, is um, if we're, if, and you know, these are, who knows where it's gonna go, but if we're saying the average is gonna be three and a half percent over five years, and if their spending is gonna be roughly one and a half, you know, maybe a little bit higher, 1.6, then we're basically almost mandating that the growth rate can only be 1.9% in total. Um, and again, I'm not saying that it should or shouldn't be. I absolutely want to see that there's savings and everything. I just think it's being clear of what that expectation would be five years down the road is that it's not at the 3.5% growth that we're holding them to. It's offsetting by the administrative costs, which we all hope happen. I'm, trying to, I'm not saying I don't hope this happens, but you know what, what the net of that I'm interpreting, and maybe I'm interpreting it wrong, is that five years out, if we hit the three five, and if their administrative costs were between, you know, one and a half to two percent, that the net growth will end up being, you know, under two percent. So actually, if I can make a friendly amendment to this, because I think there's a broader interpretation of healthcare savings here, and so I, I definitely appreciate the addition of the open duration of the agreement because I think it's going to take over. 
25 years, and we have initial investments right now that we have to make. But I would like to make a friendly amendment that the estimated savings could include cost avoidance and the value of improved health. And I think you, there are uh, mechanisms to evaluate or to quantify the value of improved health. So it's difficult, it's challenging, and it's an estimate. But I think those are two important components of, of the value of this model that go beyond just you know, straight up uh, savings below what's estimated. Okay. Well, let's deal one point at a time. <laughs> Jess asked for a request for a friendly amendment, and I'd like to hear if Robin considers it to be friendly. Yeah, I, I do, because I think that uh, in by the wording saying savings projected to be generated through the model, the model is bigger than just the ACO component, because part of what we're trying to do is shift dollars to primary care, for example, and we know that there will always be some primary care outside of, of the ACO itself. Um, so I think that it, that mirrors my intent. So yes, I would consider it friendly. Who seconded the original motion? Just did. Okay. <laughs> so I guess I don't have to ask you. <laughs> so it's been uh, accepted as a, a friendly amendment. Tom? <clears throat> I, uh, I, 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 I um, am supportive of the overall concept. Uh, I mean, this whole effort is to reduce healthcare costs and save money and invest in population health, and, and uh, it's truly a, a kind of a normal, a noble effort. Um, where I have uh, um, maybe a question is, um, or a comment, is how this, your amendment relates specifically to um, the uh, provision number nine, uh, which says one year's administrative expense ratio must be consistent with its proposed budget if the expense ratio increases by more than 1% from the budget, one care must promptly inform the board. And at our last meeting, uh, I, I asked, well, what does this mean? Does this mean that um, uh, because it was 1.7% uh, was, was the ratio, uh, does this mean that if 1% is added to that, uh, it could go up to 2.77%? Uh, and the answer was yes. Um, so that, that doesn't seem to be constrained enough to me when we're dealing with a budget that are hard numbers on an annual basis versus a budget that relates to your overall goal of savings. Um, and to underscore that point, if, um, at, and I know where the 1.77% came from, uh, if it's uh, equal to 15.9 million, and it's the 15.9 million as a numerator divided by the 898.6, a million in total revenues, 1.77 percent. So if we allowed, uh, as number nine is drafted, to go up to 2.7 percent, that's another 8.9 million dollars, uh, which is a 56 percent increase, um, and is a big number. And that's not something that that I want to vote for in a budget that says uh, you're at a 1.77 percent. The number you presented is 15.9 million dollars. But uh, you, but up to an additional percent, you can go ahead and spend it, and then above that, you come back to the board. Um, so I was kind of looking at language in the same vein that would basically um, not lock them in to the uh, um, uh, 15.9 million, but put more constraint on it by basically saying that uh, you know if the total revenues um, are projected to increase, the expense ratio shall remain at 1.77 percent. Um, unless otherwise approved by the board. So as their revenues go up, their spending can go up. Um, but if total revenues are projected to decrease, the administrative expense shall not exceed the 15.9 million. So there's a floor at 15.9 million, and then a commensurate increase uh, in administrative expenses as their total revenue rises. Um, but So I'm having a hard time, because I, I want to be supportive, uh, the hard time relating this more general principle to this specific dollar and cents budget. Yeah, I think I think that number nine and what I'm proposing should be two separate conditions because I think what you're talking about is specific to 2019 yes. and what triggers a review of 2019, whereas uh, the condition that I'm suggesting with Justice Amendment is more uh, setting 
Right, it's I more guess. of setting a principle out there and an expectation that this will be part of uh, a look back later on when we're trying to evaluate how we think we did. So I would keep them separated. Right, well then for me, um, I applaud your motion and uh, we'll move on to number nine when we get there. Okay. Which might be after your motion. <laughs> Okay, is there other discussion on the motion? So before we vote though, it sounded to me from what Tom just said that he has an amendment on uh, one of the staff recommendations, which we should probably address before we vote on my motion because my motion included all 16 positions. I don't know, so that's a question for you. So I think there's a couple more um, Okay. Points that are probably wanted yeah. to discuss, and the question is, is it cleaner to do it on the underlying uh, motion, or is it cleaner to do it as separate discussions once the underlying motion has been uh, voted up or down? Uh, I have no idea, so I defer to you. <laughs> what do you think is But cleaner? seeing that nobody is making a motion to uh, further amend, I further amend. I think he is making a motion. I think he's making a motion. Well, he hasn't made the motion, so I assume he was going to make a separate motion after the other vote. But if he wishes to, well, I, I, I have two other, two that and one other yep. that that um, that were are part of the package. And so, if voting on Robin's motion means that we accept with her amendment all the rest of the package, uh, I'm not there yet. Well, her her motion did accept all the rest of the package. So I guess, Tom, the best thing for you to do is proceed with your other two motions. Okay. So as I, as I just said a minute ago, thank you, Mr. Chair, for steering me in the right direction. Um, as I said a minute ago, specifically, and I remember uh, when the head of One Care was here, very proudly saying that um, uh, their administrative expense was 1.8% of premium if you compare it to uh, commercial insurance. and um, and. Uh, and, and was you know, very supportive of 1.8%. I'm trying to say, okay, well, um, you've given us the number of 1.77%, that's $15.9 million, um, and uh, it's, a, it's a respectable number, but if we accept number nine as crafted, it would allow one care to spend up to 27% you know, of uh, gross revenues or another $8.9 million, and that seems too constrained to me. So. I have this language um, that tries to be allow them to grow on the upside but puts a floor on the downside because this is a startup entity. We only have two to three quarters worth of data here and I don't want to be an overly tight lot person when people are trying to, to, to do something uh, new and creative. So um, my uh, the substitute motion for number nine would be to eliminate the second sentence which says if the expense ratio increases by more than 1% from the budget, one care must promote, was, must promptly inform the board. And uh, substitute for that, and this is again just for fiscal uh, year 2019, if total revenues, which is the basis for the 1.77%, are projected to increase, the expense ratio shall remain at 1.77% uh, unless otherwise approved by the board. So this allows one care's administrative budget to go up if revenues exceed um, uh, you know, what, what they have in their, in, in their budget. And if total revenues are projected to decrease, the administrative expenses shall not exceed uh, $15,915,189. So on the downside- Can you give me that number again? Uh, it's the number that's in their budget and it's 15 million Nine hundred fifteen thousand one hundred eighty-nine dollars, and so so there's a floor that 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 is a floor, so that if if uh, as we discussed at our last board meeting, if one of the payers pulls out, uh, it doesn't you know if you kept it tied to the percentage, it would mean that their administrative budget would go way down, and so there's a floor and there's up, upside risk, and so you know with, with this substitute, and the other motion I should talk about, Mr. Chair. Or unless, or unless we want to discuss Let's it. Let's do one at a time. Okay. I, I just. So we to approve it. So you've made a second motion to amend. He's made a motion to amend. Is there a second? I'll second.
Yeah, now we're going to discuss it. And the first question I would have for the staff is, um, is there a scenario under which on the upside that uh, expenses might raise, rise higher than the 1.77%, but it could still be a, a good investment over time? I'm not sure with some of the um, numbers still still moving around. Um, but my guess is if they, you know, with what Tom put forth, um, they would just need to come in and let you know, and most likely it would be they incorporated a new organization within their organizational structure um, that was unplanned at the time of budget. Um, but again, they would just need to come in. This year we did see a decrease. I think, uh, Tom, I, I think it's a good idea. I think the 1% was, was too high when you actually look at the concept. Um, I'd like to amend yours a little bit, which is the one scenario you didn't really address is um, if they came in right at the you know dollar amount for the NPR and then we're still confining them to the 15.9 million, I think they're, in order for them to have to come back to the board, it should be a percentage, let's say, I'll throw out a number, but 10% over or 5% over. So if their 16 million were to go up by more than a certain amount, because to hold them to the exact number, it's a budget and every budget number is wrong. Um, just because of the way we budget, it's gonna be up or down anyway. So um, we hope it's favorable. I'm just saying before they have to come back to the board, I would agree with you know, your scenario, if, it, if, if the dollars go up in NPR, they can raise, you know, up to, a, up to a point without having to come back, you know, there's a floor. But then it's just to say, in order for them to really trigger to come back to the board, I would put a percent and I would say 10% over the budget. Um, and they certainly can come back before then if they needed to, but. I think I understand um, what you're saying. Um, so, uh, I tried to structure this so that there is upside growth if the NPR goes up. So, that, um, so just hypothetically, if uh, if uh, their gross revenues come in a million bucks more than expected, they get 1.77 percent of that in addition to the base amount. So, there's no downside risk to them. It's a floor. It's and upside risk grows with the uh, with the, the ratio that they. Yeah, in my scenario, I'm saying if if their dollars were, then it's not a billion, but if it were a billion and they had the 15 million and they stayed at the billion and then they went up to 16 million because they were just wrong in their budget, okay. I'm saying you haven't given them any flexibility there, so they have to come, you know, they have to come in if they're at 16 million or five, you know, we haven't given a range, and so I, I think there's always a range in the budget you're going to miss. We could say it's five percent. I was giving, you know, ten percent, but I just wanted to put something on there to say I, I totally agree. The extra one percent, you know, that's not really. A, if they did come back with that, the year later we'd really be saying, wow, you spent, you know, nine million dollars more. But giving them something in there just so it's not required. So I get what you're saying. Do you have a number? Let's put it in. So. Let me just ask a question, because I think what I heard Maureen suggest is asking you if it would be considered a friendly amendment if you allowed for um, a 10% fluctuation around the 1.77%, um, um, but keeping in place the uh, floor of the 15.9 uh, should they um, have reduced revenues. Am I stating your request properly? Um, I guess, yes, you've converted it into the percent, the 1.7, so um, no, that's not actually, yeah. Because I'm saying if they, in this case, if they hit their NPR exactly as they stated, but they come in higher on their dollar amount. And I think what- It might work out somehow. Yeah, what I was saying is that the, the 1.77 plus or minus 10%, where I don't like the plus or minus is if their NPR grows by a lot, which it might as, as we true up where 
you know, where we were thinking actually like Medicare may actually be higher than what was in their budget submission, that could be a pretty high number. So this was really, you know, stay with the 1.7 if you go to a higher NPR number. If you're at the current number, you have a little flexibility before you have to come back. Okay. Um, I just need to be able to state your motion. Do you want me to try? <laughs> As former legislative drafter. <laughs> uh, so can I see what, can be what you have, Tom, um, well, let me see if I can try. Okay, so I, I think the motion would be to amend condition nine to strike the last sentence and insert in lieu of that, if total revenues are projected to increase, the expense ratio shall remain at 1.77% unless otherwise approved by the board. If total revenues are projected to decrease, the administrative expense shall not exceed 10, uh, this, I'm gonna round it up to say $16 million plus 10%. Did that get what you wanted? I could accept that. I, I wasn't, if, if they were falling short, I was keeping them at the floor. Okay. So if they came in at 800 million instead of 840, I don't think that they should get the extra there. It was really they just came in on budget, but I can live with that. Okay. <laughs> I can add another sentence if it's okay. As long as it's not clear, it's clear that the plus 10% isn't it doesn't make that 11.77 percent. It makes it right. Right. So I'm, yes. so I'm, not, I'm not sure what instance of so. amendment we're into here, Tom. But do you consider that to be a friendly amendment to your motion? Yes, I do. <laughs> okay. I mean, I I I, uh, I agree with Maureen that no budget is ever perfect, and uh, yep. and what she's trying to do is uh, address that situation, and so I view it as a friendly amendment. Good. <laughs> is there further discussion? Not all those in favor of um, the proposed amendment to condition nine signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay. I understand you have another one. Right. So, um, in this, uh, I think this is in the spirit of transparency and the fact that most of the ACO's budget comes from the public sector, at least at this point in time, from Medicare and Medicaid. Um, and we ask. Um, hospitals to provide us with uh, uh, salary and compensation information. We have um, uh, that information from their IRS 990s, which doesn't apply to um, the ACO. And so um, I'm looking to develop some transparency about the salary structure at the ACO. So this would be my uh, proposed amendment. In consultation with the Green Mountain Care Board staff, one care shall develop a format for reporting compensation and benefits of officers, directors, trustees, key employees, and highest compensated employees. Such format shall be submitted to the board for approval no later than June 30th, 2019, and filed for fiscal year 2018 with One Care's 2020 budget proposal. Is there a second? For purposes of discussion, the chair will second the motion. Discussion? I think if you want to get that information, that could be required. You know, we could ask for that during the budget. I don't know that it should be in the order. And I'm not sure in the context what would we do with that information, specifically without knowing how it is relative to other ACOs to, you know, by each person and what they do and what they're hired, why they were hired, and what the credentials for, were for their hiring. So. so I actually support the motion because I think that um, the purpose isn't for us to do something with it, but it's just to create transparency for um, the, the public, which is paying for a large portion of this through Medicare, Medicaid dollars. And um, I think it's consistent with what we do during hospital budget budgets to request the information for transparency purposes only. And I don't see why um, the 
the ACO should be treated differently than that just because they're a for-profit versus a non-profit organization. So um, that's my two cents on it. Any other discussion? I think what we did for the hospital budget is um, we did put it in an order. We put it in their request for presentation. We bucketed it by salary type. And we also had supported what their HR hiring was behind that and where um, where it was relative to national. Because I, I just think getting a number, um, you know, I don't see the benefit of that. Can I ask a question? Um, you said that the So there is no format right now, and so this would be asking one care to work with staff to develop a format, um, not something imposed on them necessarily but to develop a format, that they bring then the format to the board um, and say, here's the format that we think works, um, and, uh, and uh, the board accepts it or doesn't. If they accept it, then the first report would be with their 2020 budget. Right. So I guess I'm also more comfortable with this as something to be developed as part of the guidance for the next year's budget because it's not, we don't have any evidence in front of us one way or the other around this. So it's not like we're ordering something based on our guidance for 19 with which we collected information. So certainly as when we get to the point where we're discussing our guidance for 2020, a topic that we discuss and make a determination on. Um, but again, process-wise, since we are new to the ACO budget process, we're, I think we have a little bit of growing pains as we try and sort out like what's in a budget, what should be in guidance, what should be in an order, how do we deal with enforcement of last year's order when we're doing next year's order before last year is over. Uh, but for me, it's it would be better placed in, this, in guidance. Well, just trying to reach a consensus among the board. Um, another suggestion would simply be that uh, I ask the chair write to uh, One Care and ask them to um, report the salary information consistent with the same uh, reporting that would have been required if they had been a nonprofit and had to file on 990. And I, I take your point that. Um, this may not be the best place for that, but um, I would also hope the board would be supportive of allowing me to uh, send a letter, at least asking them to provide it. Um, can I just comment on this? As far as putting it in the budget review at this time, there's nothing in the budget to review as part of this. We do have a, a period where we will have the guidance as was pointed out. Um, I think it's most appropriate there, and I don't think that um, I don't think it necessarily precludes you, chair, from asking one care for information. But the cleanest um, process would be, as we do with hospital budget guidance, also is to have that discussion at that time and get that that um, information for review of whatever sort you might think it needs. Um, as so, Tom, are you willing to withdraw the motion, or would you like to continue? No, I would draw the, the motion under the hope or expectation that uh, this becomes uh, part of the budget guidance, um, and that uh, so I do think it important. I mean, some some you know salaries are what they are, and and as a public sector employee, I've had to deal with these issues at, at the state level, and and sometimes it's a red flag, but sometimes it's helpful, and the, the public is very interested in how their money is being spent, and I think this is a, a key metric for them. And uh, so as long as this is in our uh, budget guidance for the ACO, um, it works for me. So, so I'll, I'll withdraw my motion. I thank you for withdrawing it. I am going to take it a step further and send the letter, though, only because I think that this is even more important than what we asked for in the guidance for the hospitals, because 
the hospital information was available, even though it was under a lengthier time lag because um, of the filing of 990s being public information, the public could at least get that information. And by virtue of one care not falling under that same criteria, if somebody doesn't require the information, will never be transparent. So, thank you, Tom. Is there any other uh, discussion on uh, Robin's motion to uh, accept the uh, conditions along with the uh, one additional condition and the changes to condition nine that were previously voted on? Any further discussion? If not, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? So, Michael, team, I just want to say that uh, I know that you've had some sleepless nights. Um, the way this process is set up, it uh, is a very frustrating one as far as time periods, as we're waiting for information from our partners, both in federal government, state government, and one care. And I know that uh, you and your team have uh, worked in an exemplary manner to uh, get us to this point today. And uh, I thank you. And uh, with that, does anybody have any further questions for the team? No, I would just like to echo your thanks to the team and also to uh, all of to Tom and to Maureen and to Jess and to you, Kevin, in terms of your thoughts and uh, you know, go, putting our thoughts out there and having this discussion in public is not an easy one, but I appreciate So uh, the next item is old business. Uh, Susan, with the uh, inability for us to, um, oh, that's true. We did uh, notice public comment. Is there any public comment? Yes, Dale. I just want to comment that as complicated as this is, I actually think that in some ways we have it oversimplified. Um, it makes sense for the level at which we're carrying on the conversation. I would just like to remind us all that underneath that is people actually using the healthcare system, which have a totally different experience than the one we talk about here. Um, when we're talking about the state Medicaid, um, we're talking about Medicaid experience. We're talking about Medicare experience. When I go out there and talk with people, I'm talking with people that are talking with me about they can't bring down their cable budget because it's also their phone and their internet. If it's $160, it's $160 or you get disconnected. Their rent, they can't do anything about their rent. It's not going to come down. It's not negotiable. When I talk with them about their health care, they'll say, I wanted this plan, but the premium was almost double of the cheapest plan, but it had less co-pays. It had more to offer that integrates with this but they can only afford the cheaper plan. And the cheaper plan doesn't integrate as well into the all-payer model, into Medicaid or Medicare. And I've carefully been looking at that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's one of the things that I think sometimes we don't think about. 
when you get people that can only afford the cheapest plan, it doesn't integrate well into the kind of health care we're thinking about. The co-pays are more, everything is more expensive if you have to use that plan. It's almost like a fee-for-service plan that you're buying, but everything we're trying to get away from is fee-for-service. And I, I just find it a real irony. I think you've raised uh, some really valid points, uh, Dale, and of course, every individual is different, and it depends on where they fall in the spectrum of uh, the ability to get subsidies. And in some cases, um, they can have a better health plan. In some cases, they can't. And, uh, you know, that's why we're trying to, to move towards keeping people healthier, trying to look at um, wellness versus uh, sickness, trying to move away from fee-for-service. And, um, you know, we, we're making incremental steps, but we're certainly a, a long, long ways from where we need to be. Thank you, Dale. Any other public comment? Seeing none. Uh, under old business, Susan, uh, uh, I understand that uh, we have postponed the, the presentation on the plan for consent on HIE to the first meeting of January. Is there any need um, then to even have a meeting on Wednesday or should it just be canceled? The meeting on Wednesday should be canceled. Okay. So without objection from other members of the board, we'll cancel the meeting on Wednesday? I'm saddened about because I didn't get to uh, dress in my Christmas attire. Because <laughs> 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 I expected that we were going to have a meeting on Wednesday. We are saddened as well. To <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure it'll make an appearance. Sometime. It'll show up in our office. So if anybody needs to, we can maybe Skype you in too. Do a video. Okay, is there any other old business to come before the board? Is there any new business to come before the board? Seeing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. It's been moved and seconded to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? So thank you everyone and have